know them by their heart, but then we talked about that gets a little bit tr difficult because you can't judge a heart or motives. So uh, that that kind of got a little bit a little bit complicated. So we said this: you can judge or not judge, but you can know you can know a bad heart because bad fruit comes from a bad heart. So in other words, um, false teachers and stuff. Eventually, if you watch them for long enough. Some, you know what I mean? You'll, you'll, you'll see. Um, which kind of brings an interesting point worth considering. That our beliefs and our actions and our words and our, and our motives, they're all linked. We like to think that we can hide what's really inside from people, but eventually it all comes out. It eventually all comes out. And our beliefs, what we think about stuff, affects how our actions, what we do, which also affects our words, what we say, which also affects our motives, why we do something. We as a person are one person, you know what I mean? And all of those aspects of us, they're all linked. And so if there's something – if somebody is a false teacher or, or something like that, you're going to see that if they might have a good show and they might even fool you for years. But eventually, if you watch close enough, you're, you'll see things start to surface. So I also mentioned last week that when we talk about um, – a bad heart producing bad fruit, that's not the same as messing up because we're all sinners. We all mess up. Bad fruit is not messing up. Nobody is perfect. Um, bad fruit is more something like um, the overall result, not the individual mistakes, the overall result. This person is a contentious person. They start fights wherever they go. That is their fruit, not... In that one situation 20 years ago, they messed up and how they dealt with this. That's not what we're talking about. Everybody messes up. But when somebody goes from person to person to person making problems, every church they go to, they, they cause problems and split the church apart. That's that's kind of what we're talking about, bad fruit. Um, so you won't know the false by their words, their appearance, or their good works. Um, you will know the false by their heart, which will produce bad fruit. You can't judge a person's heart or their motives, but you can be aware of the fruit they produce. So... Then we looked at what is the mark of the real, and we said that it is none of these things. It is not their pleasant personality. It's not whether they can perform miracles, whether or not they serve others, whether they have smooth words, give good speeches, uh, whether they have a good social status, or their appearance. It's none of those things. And so we asked the question, so then what is the mark of the real? If we can't know by all the things that everybody in our society puts such a high stake on, then how can we really know? Uh, what is really the mark of the real? And um, you guys thought, had a chance to think about this all week. Did anybody come up with anything that they'd like to share? In his verse? Are you pointing at Eli? That's rude. I'm <laughs> just kidding. I'm joking. I'm joking. Did you, Isaiah? Uh, no, I, well, I, I hadn't been thinking of it, but now, now I kind of thought it was a good Sure. What? What is the question again? <laughs> <laughs> what is the mark of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a false teacher? Uh, so let me say that differently because I'm saying it wrong. What is the mark of someone not being a false, te a false uh, teacher, a false leader? What is the mark of, of the real? I, would, I was going to say good fruit, but then I would ask, like, how, would, how, do you, how would you define uh, good fruit? Okay. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a good answer. Are you gonna say something? Can you put the question that way? Would it be maybe something like biblically sound preaching and teaching? I think that has a lot to do with it. It's a good answer. Eli, did you have anything? Um. I mean, if you don't have an answer, that's okay. Like um, like if you like if. If you can tell they're like a real, like a, what do you call it? What you're saying? If you can tell that they're genuine? Oh, yeah. Like, uh, either like the way they preach or the way they talk or like how they treat <clears throat> themselves or something. Okay. Around that. A lot of times you can tell. Okay. Grace, you have anything? Um, I think um, honesty has a big thing with it. Um, honesty? Yeah, like, if, if, if most of the time, whenever people are real, um, they they try to stay honest, okay. um, and they don't try to have multiple personalities. You know, like with okay. this person, I'm this way with the other person, I'm that way. Okay. So there's there's the same around everybody. 
Yeah. You gotta watch out for this black hole of people. <laughs> That's actually what I thought of. But I I, 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 mean, I didn't say a word. Any, almost all the false prophet people I've met, they, I, I say they have multiple personalities because every person they talk to, they're a different person with. Mm. They, they, they see what that person wants to, um, wants from them, and they act that way. Mm. So that way they can win people over. Mm. It's about manipulating people. Yeah. Which is one one reason why I say that you cannot trust their smooth words right. or their appearance or their pleasant personality yeah. because it changes right and to go off of what Gracie just said sure right like a lot of people if they're not real they'll tell you what you want to hear so what you need mm -hmm. right yeah and also um to, to go back to my question like how would you define how would you define good fruit like real good fruit it, it's kind of challenging because there's a lot of false teachers out there that have the appearance of good the appearance fruit. Appearance of good fruit, like right. Mother Teresa, you know, she fed the homeless and took care of people and did all these good things, which is good fruit, but it didn't lead to salvation for anyone, at least not that we know. Of, you know, mm. she didn't uh, share the gospel with with people. Um, she just gave them food and clothing and. Mm. I uh, I'm gonna be honest. I uh, I know about Mother Teresa, but I've never read like a book about her life, so I'm not overly sure about whether she was winning people to God or not. I I don't know that. I I don't know. I, I, kind, of, I kind of looked into her background. So just, she was into some interesting theology. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, let's see what was it? okay. So let's see. The appearance of, of of good fruit. That's that's a good point. If I had to summarize, I would narrow it down to one thing. And I guess I probably need to give some explanation for this one thing, and that's love. And the reason why I don't think it's primarily beliefs is because me personally I've gone years of ha of not believing completely perfect on an issue and then still have God use me you know what I mean and I wasn't purposely teaching false things but at the same time you're going to believe some things that aren't some, that aren't true you know that, no, no, least theology is that right true. right you're exactly what I'm trying to say your 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 beliefs are not perfect so this is why I think that love is the pri is the is the primary thing here. A new commandment I give you: love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The mark of how you would know if somebody was a follower of Jesus was that they loved one another. Okay. So then, First John four twenty: Whoever claims to love God and yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. So then this gets a little bit tricky because then you say, well, so what is love? And there's there's a lot of a lot of uh, different beliefs <laughs> about what love actually is. You know, um, so you have a lot of false preachers out there, false teachers who are purposely misleading people, but then oh, love, love, love. You know, and so it, there has to be like a certain what do mean? What do we mean by love? And I hope to bring some clarity to that. So, what does love look like? Well, I've seen genuine people, genuinely loving people, and then I've seen false people pretending to love people. I noticed that it looks like this. First off, is an issue of whether they are profited by it or not. It's easy to love someone when it increases your uh, stock with people, when they're likable people. But when somebody continually mistreats you and you still treat them correctly, that's different. That's a lot different. You see, for instance, pastors who will continually and continually pour into people who are backstabbers. I mean, just complete jerks and still pour into them. And then you see other people who, I mean, if you so much as 
imply that they aren't perfect, they get mad. Like, here's a good example. And it, there's an interview with Kenneth Copeland where um, the interviewer is talking to, talking to him, and he turns very mean oh, very quickly and starts – with when the SUV, and he, he starts – I mean, gets all up in her and gives her the evil eyes and points at her and stuff. It's like, you know, that's not loving. And why did he get all mad? Because she was calling him out on something that he had said. Oh, God forbid that I admit that I did something wrong. Oh, no. Let's not – let uh, I couldn't be wrong. You know, I, I'm perfect all the time. See what I mean? And, and so there's that unwilling to submit to submit to to truth. <coughs> so what does love really look like? Well, look at a few different things. First off, what is their history in churches? Where were they at before this church? Did they cause problems in the churches that they were at before? Do they do they does it magically do they magically um, find themselves in conflicts? In the church that they're currently going to, is it? Just, oh, they just happen to be in the middle of a conflict every single time. Okay. Um, do they have a history of conflicts in the church where, where they're? It seems like they're always opposing a pastor, or they're always getting involved in between two people's tiffs. I mean, there was there was one false prophet that we had uh, probably this last year, I guess, who came, and so they started going over the, going over and meeting with this other person in the church, and this other person in the church had a really bad attitude, and they were just affirming that bad attitude. Yep, you're right. That person is a pain in the butt, and then they started making up stories about it. That person did so and so to me too. And it's like. That didn't happen. I was there. You know what I mean? But they found a way, like Gracie said, to wear that mask of offense to that person who was offended so that they could fit in with that. And then when they were around this person, oh, no, I, I'm not offended with anybody because they knew that that person didn't want them to be offended. So they literally changed their masks. That wasn't love. They weren't trying to reconcile the relationship between that offended person and that person. They were trying to ally themselves so that they could manipulate the person into joining them. See the difference? Um, how do they handle problems? When there's a problem, and this is actually one of the big things, I am very much so oppo opposed to somebody being put into church leadership until they have gone through a substantial problem where you can judge their character. It's like a little test. You need to see how they handle under pressure. You need to see what happens when the mask comes off. Everybody can put forward a good show. Look a good part. But when when things actually – well, when the crap hits the fan, so to say, it, you, you need to be able to say, how does this person actually truly react? What, 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 what's going to happen here? Because you'll notice that the false will do good, and then when you put them under pressure, all of a sudden things change. Like Kenneth Copeland, again, a great example. You know, He seems really great or whatever on his televangel tele – on the TV. There you go. And uh, then when he was under pressure with that interviewer, all of a sudden, he didn't seem like that same pleasant person. See what I mean? Um, so how do they handle problems? Use trials as a test of someone's character. Pay attention to, to how they handle problems. How do they handle po problem people? Let's say, for instance, Nicole is the person that I want to test. And... Eli is just, I mean, he's just a problem person. He goes around gossiping with different people. He's hes stirring up conflicts. I want to watch Nicole, and I want to see how she handles this. I want to know, is she going to join forces w with him and, and, how, and make the gossip problem bigger? Is she going to try and talk to him and say, look, you're really causing a lot of problems. Th this is the church. We're not supposed to be doing that. Um, you know, so kind of use it as a test. Um, who do they hang around with? This is a really, really good indicator because we, we attract people who are like us, and also we tend to make people who hang around with us disciples of us. You know what I mean? When you hang around with someone for, for a certain period of time, you start to kind of pick up how they act. It's like this. They say in, in finance classes, if you want to be richer, look at the five people who you're closest to. You will always meet their economic status. Always. And so if you want to be a smarter person and earn more money, the first step is to get better uh, economic friends, <laughs> more financially talented people, so, so to speak. If you hang around with people who do drugs all the time, you're probably going to get involved into drugs. <laughs> if you hang around with people who gossip all the time, you're probably going to start gossiping. If you hang around with people who have a bad attitude all the time, you're probably going to get it's, – it's, it's not that complicated of, of an idea. It's a real simple idea. Um, so who do they hang around with? Um, you'll find that troublemakers, they just have this radar. Oh, somebody's a troublemaker. I can sense it. 
Uh, and then they'll hone in on the person, you know what I mean? And then all of a sudden, they'll be friends with the person. Um, we had this one person who, I mean, they're as bitter as could be, and we tried talking about them. Nothing would work with this person. Well, as time went on, there were some people who just problem people. And so I, I mentioned in a sermon, you know, hey, you, you might want to watch out for these people and for these kinds of people too. And no sooner had I said that, the very next week they started being friends with those, with those people. Why? Because it was a thing about t just testing authority. You know what I mean? It was just it was just a rebellious attitude, which is funny because you'll hear people talk a lot about demons, but what they don't what they don't put together is that what was it? What, how does Samuel say it? He says, "Rebellion is as of witchcraft. It's the same. It it, it has the same effect as witchcraft. Think about that. Just think about that." How many people do you hear? We have authority over demons, but then they don't have, and they're not under authority themselves. How are you possibly going to have authority over demons if you're not under authority? See what I mean? And that just doesn't make any sense. And another thing that people don't really think too hard about is there is this kind. Of, well, I guess it's a discussion for another day, but we'll probably come back to that some other time. It doesn't really have anything to do with this, so we'll get back onto this. Um, so, who do they hang around with? Do they try and strong arm people into doing what they want? Do they try and enforce their will on others? Or do they try and be supportive of the church, uh, you know, build stuff up instead of tearing it down? Do they have ulterior motives of getting a position, power, money, pleasure? So you'll see some people will be all nice and everything, and then all of a sudden, and I see this all the time, being one of the associate pastors, um, they'll be all nice and then they'll say, hey, um, what do you think about me doing this ministry? It's like, ah ha ha, that's why you were pretending to be all nice. You wanted me to let you do that, and you know that there's not a chance in hell that I'm going to let you do that. So then you say, no. And then there's two two things that typically happen. They get really mad at you, or see, that that's most often the thing that happens because they're they kind of like break break face a little bit. Sometimes though, what happens is they instantly start trying to repair repair the breach. They pretend like it didn't happen, and they be all pretend to be all nice again. Oh, I mean, you guys have met fake people before. I mean, I know you have. <laughs> they pretend to be all nice and oh, oh, oh. And then as soon as you let down your guard, oh, surprise, surprise, here they come with the freaking knife again. You know what I mean? And it's it's one of those things. So, uh, do they have ulterior motives of getting a position or getting power, getting money, getting pleasure? Do they genuinely care and care for others at their own expense? Do when they go to the church, or do they actually care? This is God's church. This is the body of Christ. Do they really care about these people? Do they care about not leaving them abandoned? Do they, do they really invest in these people? Do they care? Do they care for others at their own expense? It's easy to say, oh, I care. I, 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 care. I love people. It's harder to take that care, and even when it costs you your happiness, um, your, your, your night's sleep, your, you know, to be invested in that person. The, you, you, if, if you know half the stories of some of my pastor friends where they will literally be all, up all night with the person that stabbed them in the back at the hospital. Losing an entire night's sleep to comfort somebody who's in the hospital that doesn't even like them. Or some, of, or here's another uh, one, one of the pastors that I know. Um, I probably don't have the right to tell that story, so I won't tell that story. But um, some of these, a lot of them, these are these are people who I know are real people. They're, they're genuine leaders. They're genuine pastors. You can see it by how they treat people. Um, they genuinely care, even at their own expense. There was this one person who caused such a problem, such a problem. They went to the community and caused a problem in the community and everything. And still, this pastor dealt with them very patiently, tried to rectify the situation, even after they had stirred up the whole community against them. It was, I could not believe this person's patience. It was unreal. Do they really care at their own expense? When it costs them everything, when it costs them their money, when it costs them their time, when it costs them, do they still care? Because I can guarantee you the fake, they don't. For, for the fake, and I've, I've seen the, I see this a lot, they try to use their money to buy people. That happens actually quite a lot. Um, there was a time when we were making some changes that really needed to happen in the church. And uh, there was this person who, who used to have power and lost power and influence. And so what he tried to do is he tried to imply that we would lose his financial support. 
We were like, "Joke's on you. We've lived our whole life poor. We're, we're going to get by either way." And the money, God's not. You're not going to provide. God's going to provide. So I mean, uh, you know that that they went through on their on their, you know, oh, and they stopped paying tithes. But it's like, I don't I don't live for a paycheck. If I wanted a paycheck, I wouldn't be a pastor. So <laughs> not overly concerned about that. Um, do they love the unlovable when they don't feel like it and when it doesn't profit them? That that's something where because I mean if we're honest with each other do we do that no of course we don't do that right like we have moments try. we we try and we have moments but the the false what they do is they want to put forth the appearance of love without actually actually having the commitment of love and that's that's a whole different world do they serve others for that person's benefit. Or, just, or, or do they do it so that they can say, well, I tried, but, you know, that person's just stubborn. Okay. <laughs> Listen and watch for long enough and don't give trust unless earned. This is something that I want you to remember and remember and remember. This applies not just to false teachers. This applies to most everything in life. Trust must be earned before it's given. Remember that. Write it down in your brain and keep repeating that to yourself. Trust must be earned before it's given. You don't just allow people to have influence in your life and just trust people blindly. That's just a huge mistake. You're going to end up regretting it. I guarantee it. Um, but with that being said, also, if you've trusted someone in the past and kind of blew up on you, don't, don't shut people out for forever. I mean, you have to... Be be wise, but don't be don't be bitter. Pay attention to beliefs um, that that the people have and relativistic statements. So what I mean by that is a lot of times false teachers they won't really preach with commitment or with conviction. They'll say this, but then like they'll also kind of condone like let's say the spiritism of the Native Americans or. Um, Witchcraft or um, other religions that aren't Christianity. Well, I mean, it's all it's all gets you to the same place, you know. It's it's the heart that counts. Whereas the biblical prophet said this: "My people perish for lack of knowledge," and so that's quite a statement from what the fake will say. Um, but that's that's not your only uh, your only tester right there, because I mean, Kenneth Copeland he really talks about Jesus a lot. He talks about other things too. But see what I mean? You have to kind of take the whole into account. You can see, you can, you can see right through him, though. <laughs> well, not everybody can. <laughs> um, so, oh, here are some encounters that I already mentioned some, but I'll give you some more examples. Um, there was this person who, like Gracie already mentioned this, they were a different person behind your back as to your face. They put on different masks for different people. Grace, you already mentioned that. Um, supporting someone's bad attitude, even pretending that they had also – I already mentioned that story. Um, the person who pretended to be offended to the person who was offended so they could manipulate them. Um, and you know what the thing is? It, this is the tragic thing is, is if you're going to take advantage of people and whatnot, don't do it to the weak and, and the, 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 the people who can't defend themselves. Like that's low. Yeah, it's just it's just, there's no honor to it. You know what I mean? Like taking advantage of people is one thing. I, I wouldn't say take advantage of people, but if you're gonna take advantage of people, don't do it to the weak and and, and disoriented and the hurt. Don't seek somebody who's hurt and say that looks like an easy mark. Yeah, they are in an easy mark, but there's some things you just shouldn't do. Like have some class. That's like taking taking money from an orphan or beating up a widow. Which just you don't do that. Like there's just some things you just don't do. Like. <laughs> Anyways, um, I already mentioned in this story too, trying to be so nice that they could do a certain ministry, um, and then repeated the behavior, trying to trying to try again, like we could we would eventually buy into the lie or something. Um, oh, here's here's another story. There was there was another person who this was very sneaky. So what they would do is they pretend they pretended to be nice until they were accepted. So this took a couple weeks. Then after those couple weeks, what they started doing is they started saying these little snide comments. And what, the reason why they did it is because they were trying to get a rise out of people, and kind of trying to um, reject the person's authority in in, in front of a group. Um, actually, one of these people w went went to a, a hit party Gracie was Gracie was teaching at, and they kept saying these little snide comments, trying to. Trying to you know discredit Gracie while she was teaching, and 
trying to get a rise out of her. Thank God Gracie has more sense than to take the bait. Um, but then uh, another reason why they do this is because they send out little feelers. They want to know if other people are, dis are, are dissatisfied. They want to know if there's people in the room that they can manipulate. So they'll say these little snide comments and just watch to see how people re react. And if the overwhelming attitude in the room is, well, that was rude, then, oh, I'm just kidding, ha, ha it's funny to be rude and snide. But then if that's not the overwhelming thing in, in the room, they'll keep saying it, and, and then they get influence all of a sudden over people. Were you going to oh, say something? Yeah, a lot of people, they like to try to instigate stuff and, like, like, yeah. like go and, like... Yeah, say these little stupid comments and... <laughs> and, like, see. and see, that that's, that is, is probably... My biggest uh, problem is because I'm the kind of person who I'll just say that again, I'll punch you in the face. And then people are like, well, you're a pastor, you can't punch people. And I'm like, oh, right, right, again with the pastor thing, I forgot about that. <laughs> so I have a little bit of a hard time with that. Typically, you don't want your pastors being short-tempered and punching people in the face. <laughs> that's that's typically bad. the spirit right now. <laughs> or the flesh. <laughs> um, so let's look at let's look at Jesus. When you ask the question, "What is love?" Let's look at Jesus. He he served, was patient, treated them as though they were more important than him. Imagine this: God Himself treating others as though they were more important than Him. Wow! And even died for them. Now now here's the thing: He did this even, even for Judas. He served even Judas. He was patient even with Judas. He treated even Judas, Judas as though he was more important than him. And he died even for Judas. That's an amazing fact. So what is love? That. In fact, I believe it's uh, 1 John that says, He showed us what real love is. Or maybe it's Romans, but I think it's 1 John. By how he died. So, love is not watching out for yourself. Love is not demanding respect. Love is not putting yourself on a pedestal. Look how great I am. Love is not trying to get attention. So uh, who should we love? Well, we should love everyone. But it's hard to love those you know in the church rather than those you've never met in the world. It's a lot easier to say I love people than it is to actually get to know people who actually cause problems and actually are annoying and then still love them. That's a lot harder, which is I think one of the reasons why it's why it's important that Christians don't don't stop going to church is because you need to be around people who are annoying so you can learn how to love them. I mean, it's just it's easier to live in a little fantasy world where you, oh no, you know, I, and I, somebody did this uh, a couple years back that I don't have a problem with any. I I love everybody. They stopped going to church because of somebody that was irritating them. And it's like, well, how do you figure that you love them? Because I, 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 I moved on. And it's like, that's not loving somebody. Love requires action. If Jesus said, oh, I love you guys, but then I'm not going to die for you, you know. But, I mean, I love you or whatever. It's like, so you don't really love us. That's not very convincing. <laughs> right? It's not very convincing. So, yes, we do have to love everyone. Um, and uh, so one, one of the things that, that is, is a test, I think, of, of our character is infighting. When we make peace with one another or when we fight with one another. It's very important that Christians learn to be peacemakers. We go to chaotic situations and resolve them. See killing in the situation. That's the mark of a Christian. Christians going behind each other's back, gossiping and, and nitpicking and, and saying little snide comments. That's, that's, that's not good. That's not good. Love is shown not just by how we treat those out there in the world, but also how we treat those here in the church. But it's also shown by how we treat others in the world too. So sometimes, sometimes in the process, we come to this kind of a conclusion. Well, I'm just I'm more spiritual than that person, though. I'm right; they're wrong. I'm more spiritual than them. Here's the thing: Jesus was more spiritual than the Pharisees and all of them too, but he still showed us how to love. You see what I mean? Sometimes we get this idea that we're just so important; they're the ones who need to apologize to me. Jesus showed us what humility really is. Maybe instead of sticking our nose in the air, we could, uh, you know. <laughs> actually love people. Um, so test yourself. Do you complain about each other? Do you gossip? Do you spread disunity? Do you resist authority? Or do you forgive? Are you patient with people? Do you consider even those who irritate you as more important than yourself? Even those who irritate you being more important than yourself. Now here's the thing. Somewhere in here you're going to say, wow, I I'm not like that. Yeah, I know. I know. None of us are. None of us are like that. But here's the thing. The false put up an air as though they're perfect, and then they use it to manipulate people. 
real people, they make mistakes. Real teachers, they make mistakes. They have gaps in their love. They mess up. They don't they don't attain that level of perfection. They, they still mess up. So if they're both doing the same thing, well, they're not both doing the same thing. The real leaders, the real teachers, they're trying. They're trying to obey God. They're trying to love people. The false ones, they're trying to make people think that they love God, that they love people, that they're so great. See what I mean? The false, it's about more of an illusion. It's about manipulating and owning people. The real, it's about genuinely trying to help people. So what makes you a real Christian or, or a fake one? Are you trying to seek God? Or you just want people to think that you're trying to seek God? See what I mean? That's and, and, and it, So I guess another way of saying this would be this. This is the easiest I can say it. Where's your heart at? If I if I summarize this whole lesson, okay, so love, okay, but I mess up. I don't love people like I should. I know. Where's your heart at? That would be the easiest way that I can summarize everything that we talked about. Do false teachers know that they are false? Not always. Some people confuse themselves. Some people they get confused by by you know demonic influences. Um, sometimes you lie so so much you just start believing your own lies. I mean, you don't know how many drug how many drug addicts do this. They'll they'll lie and they'll make up these crazy stories, and all of a sudden they'll start believing them over the course of years of lying. And be like, but you said this, yeah, I know, but that contradicts what you said over here. No, that both statements are true, but it can't both be true. One is obviously wrong. Like either you were in prison on that date, or you were over here in this place at that time. No, I was both, and it's like, okay. Um, ask God to help you with your bad attitudes. This is one of the things um, that if you have a, have a genuine heart, you will find yourself being submissive to God rather than resisting him. And the Bible says this, that God re re he, he rejects the proud, resists them. He literally does not answer them, but he accepts the humble. So... Um, Either way, you're going to have struggles coming. If you pray for God to help you with your help you with your bad attitude, you're going to face face problems because that's how He's going to teach you. But if you don't, you're still going to have struggles. You're still going to have people who irritate you. So you might as well use it as an opportunity to grow. <laughs> uh, don't lie to yourself about yourself. You will eventually believe your lies. Any questions on any of that? Well, we'll start talking more specifically about the false things next week. But I just wanted to lay that, I, that that concept of, okay, so false and true teachers, they both say and do the same things a lot of the times. But it's more about the heart, which comes out in the way that they, the way that they act. So it's about love, but it's also an issue of the heart. So I hope that I made that as clear as possible because this isn't something that we should come to lightly. And you should never go to it with this, oh, they're fake. Oh, they're fake. Be careful of putting people in boxes. I mean… Do, for instance, here, here's a good example. Do I think Joyce Meyer is a false teacher? No. I'll tell you why. She, does she believe in little gods? Yes. She actually believes that we're little gods. I believe that, that's, that that is false. I think that she's misunderstanding what Jesus said, and I think she's misunderstanding what the Psalms say. We'll look at that in a couple weeks. Probably next week or the week after. But she tries to tell people about Jesus... Jesus has actually changed her life. She she was molested as a, as a little girl, and she found healing from that bitterness. Do I think that sometimes when you're in the spotlight a lot, you get a little bit off? Yeah. I think that's very much so true the case. And does she always teach the correct thing? No. Are her beliefs perfect? No. As far as I can tell... She tries to love God and obey Him, and she tries to help others do the same. I think she's one of those teachers that is often furious and is still truly seeking. Right, yeah. right. And I think that it would do well for people who have that much spotlight to take every couple of years to take a year off and just examine themselves. Because you get in this kind of the TV face and you kind of forget who you really are and you start thinking that you're as great as everybody else says that you are and it just not, it's kind of, it's a dangerous place to be and I think we all are in danger of being there too so I hope that that kind of brings some clarity 
But then at the same time, do I think that Kenneth Copeland is a false teacher? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I think he's been focused on health and wealth so long that he doesn't even remember what the gospel is actually about. So I hope that that kind of gives you some clarity. And uh, we'll look at this next week. Now, I want you guys to seriously think about that because if you don't, if you disagree with me about what I said today or about Joyce Meyer, for instance, or about Kenneth Copeland, I would love to hear your thoughts. I would love to hear them. Um, and Chuck, I, I, I kind of wish he was here. I, I bet you he would have uh, – I bet you he would have some, some comments to say about that. So anyways, okay, we'll stop there.